the, f the fact that you are a pastor and that the Lord has given you a congregation. This time I'm talking not only that you minister, but that the congregation may minister to you. That the congregation may be an instrument in the hands of God to transform the pastor's sensitivities. Without them, you can't be who you are. Do you know that? No way. Without them, you can't be who you are. God has given you an unspeakable privilege to stand there and look in their eyes and let their eyes change you. That is one aspect of your relationship as a pastor to your congregation. Not only in a preaching situation, but in a situation such as I have read. When you are called upon to stand in a situation where you can't claim you know what to do, but simply because you are a pastor, you have to be there. And you can't get out of it. You know, you can squirm, and you can uh, rebel, you can uh, kick, but you are there. See? But if you, if you really are positive in the spirit that you are there is a blessing. Maybe a blessing in disguise for you. For the Lord, it was clear. He wept because here is God weeping tears of encouragement, not preaching but crying, holding as it were the hands of the two broken-hearted sisters and looking at the weeping community, realizing they really are helpless, aren't they? In the, in the presence of death, what can they do? They can only weep. And so that helplessness affected his inner person and moved his compassion and he cried out. Now when God weeps, the situation does change. So sometimes God has to weep through the pastor. Yeah? Don't, don't shy away from those shaking pains which come when you are involved with the congregation. So don't shy away. Don't wish you were not there. Or, or even wish the situation were better. No, no, no. Let the situation, you didn't create it. You are supposed to be there in the situation. And God means that you being there is going to affect them and affect you and let God act as God. Let God act as God. So the Lord was affected by the situation. And then he moved. The problem with us pastors is that situations in the congregation have a tendency to paralyze us. The Lord was not paralyzed. And the situation of weeping helplessly can easily paralyze anyone. I remember one day in my situation in Uganda, I heard on the radio the president of Uganda, then dictator Amin, announced that he was going to execute 12 Ugandans who had only been given, say, one hour to stand before his military tribunal. And yet Uganda has got courts of law. But he didn't. He said, courts of law are waste of time. We want summary judgment, quickly. And the people in the tribunal, many of them could not even write their names. So the people were put there. They were going to be executed. I had it on the radio. And I, I have had many bad experiences, but that one was a shaker. It really went through me like, like a needle, no, a cutting knife. I did not know what to do. Uganda is going to experience people being shot in stadiums and marketplaces publicly. And what, what do you do? I didn't know what to do. I didn't even have the courage of telling my wife. I decided, I came, I felt in my heart I should see the president. I mean, but I knew that that was most dangerous. So I didn't even tell my wife the truth. I came and said to her, um, excuse me, uh, my darling, I'm going into the city to do a little shopping. I'll be back in a minute. Actually, I was going to the president's office. I knew it would have scared her to death. 
So I went to the office, I met a minister, and he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to His Excellency's office. He's not there. He's at command post. That is his place where he lived. Because in those days he was sick with some diseases. Many Ugandans were wishing the sickness would be serious. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I think, quite serious. Anyway, I went to the office. I found there the secretary and I said, would you put me through to His Excellency? I want, I've got something very urgent to speak to him about. The secretary shook his head. He said, if I do that, I will be dead tomorrow. I dare not. Well, I said, look here, don't be, put me through to him. You just ask command post. If you find somebody, ask him, the bishop wants permission to speak to his excellency. So you get out of it. And he did. And who should come on the phone? His excellency himself. And I had never met him. I would only been a bishop one year. Never met Amin, except to seeing him in pictures. And uh, he said, I told him who I was, and I said, I've got a serious business I want to share with you. What is it? He said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't speak uh, to you about it on telephone. It needs person to person. And he hesitated, not knowing exactly what this thing is. I'm going to talk about, dictators, you know, are very great cowards. Not quite sure whether this could even mean he's being overthrown. So he said, okay, in, an, in one hour, meet me at such and such place at the President's Lodge at Makindye. Makindye is a name feared in Uganda because people who go there never come back. So I came and told my wife that I was going to meet President Amin at Makindye at, in one hour. Which, which just almost killed her. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you pray. So I went to the Archbishop, Eric Sabiti, then. I said, pray, I'm going to meet with the President. So I sat in my car. I didn't even take a driver. I sat in my car alone, and I went straight to that place. Sat. I was directed to sit. I, had to wait. I waited for about five minutes, and here comes big, big Amin with his little boy and his pistol dangling on his side, S greeted me with a bow, my Lord Bishop, sits down. And for the next 30 minutes, I just un uh, I unburdened my heart, which was not an easy talk either. It was coming from a breaking heart, a situation in which I found I, I just did not know what to do. The Lord gave me what to say. I had done a little preparation. I had my paper, but I didn't read. I just spoke to him. I knew what I was saying. And then uh, he didn't say much. And I got over with it. And he said, uh, I, I mean, I challenged him about execution and what it means to a president when he executes people he should protect. I, I challenged him. I said, you are a Muslim. You fear God. Here is life in your hands. And you've, given, you've not given that life opportunity as your boy is playing here, God is giving that boy opportunity to live as long as possible. You are not giving those Ugandans a chance to live as long as possible. And I gave him some examples. And I finished, and he looked at me, a little bit dumbfounded. And he said, um, I will put it to my defense counsel. I know that was nothing. It was a bluff. I got away, luckily, wondering, and I, but that was a tough situation in which, as a pastor, you may be caught without preparation, but compared by the fact that you represent people for whom Christ died, and here they are going to be slaughtered in stadiums. So I had to go alone, and I came out. That was a tough situation. You may be caught in this. It affected me, too. I don't think I was courageous. I was compelled. That's all I can say. I was compared. And I'm glad I was there. And I'm glad I mean knew there was someone who could speak like that. We had also been put in another situation, 10 bishops. Before that one, a year later, we went to protest again against Amin. 
compelled by the fact that he made a statement which in a month could close our church. And he made it publicly. And we were warned by commanders from his army, don't go, you bishops, we are going to see the president, don't go, you'll be shot dead. It all depends on the mood you find him in. If he wants to shoot you, he will shoot you. And we knew that. But we just couldn't escape. We felt we have to go. We went. And we read our protest in words written to him against his statement in his own house. And we spent about one hour discussing it. And in the end, God overcame. God won the victory that day because he concluded by saying, after Bishop had challenged him, when he said, well, I, do, I didn't mean that, I think I misunderstood. And our, our statement was very clear. Our faith is a matter of life and death. Your Excellency, if you want to know something about it, you call us. We'll tell you everything. There's nothing to hide. But you made a statement and it's wrong. Here are facts which show that your statement, you're wrong, Your Excellency. And the entire nation heard it. Now we know you didn't mean what, uh, to say that. What are you going to do about it? Correct it among uh, five, among ten, ten million Ugandans, five million Anglicans. And he said, okay. He commanded immediately, put it on the national radio, put the statement of the bishops in, the news, in national newspapers, put their statement on television tonight. So we became stars that night. <laughs> But you see, it was a very tough situation. Pastor, you may, be you may find yourself in a situation where you don't know how to act and come out of it. But then you will have to take the statement of our Lord. Don't you worry. He who loves himself loses himself. But he who gives himself up for the gospel's sake finds himself. 